Hello, neighbors. Welcome back to another PBS Wisconsin Educator Connection Live webinar. The goal of this webinar series is to offer high quality, relevant professional learning for educators in all learning environments. My name is Muna Algaithi, and I'm the Education Engagement Specialist with PBS Wisconsin. And one of the very fun things that I get to do is plan and facilitate events like these. I'm excited to be back with our honorable guest and renowned education researcher, Dr. Gloria Latin billings for a part two. On June 30th, we had the privilege of learning from Gloria a bit more about culturally relevant pedagogy post, I'd even say amidst two pandemics, COVID and racism, the latter having been prevalent and upheld for far too long. The chat box from that event was full of great questions, and so we compiled a list of the top 10 questions posed and invited Gloria back, and she said yes. So we get to hear her responses to those questions in just a little bit. A few housekeeping tips. If you have comments that you'd like to make, please feel free to use the chat box. For presenter-specific questions, please use the Q&A box. You'll find options for both boxes on the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. My colleagues and I will be moderating both to ensure we hear what you have to say. And for those of you who are tuning in through YouTube Live, we also have a colleague moderating that chat box. As with any conversations where critical topics are being discussed, I'd like to set community guidelines for us to practice. I won't dive deep into each of these, but we ask that you practice empathy, center your own learning, and be open to new ideas. Before we begin the Q&A, I must acknowledge that PBS Wisconsin believes that there is no place for racism in our society. We recognize that we have a responsibility to use our voice and privilege to act against racism and anti-Blackness. We have a responsibility to educate ourselves and our communities of the injustices that occur against Black and Brown students. We have a responsibility to acknowledge and face our own bias. We have a responsibility to keep this conversation learning and action moving forward, and we invite you to join us to share in on this responsibility. So a little bit about our speaker today. She is a Professor Emerita. I did have to Google how to pronounce that correctly. Professor Emerita and a former Kellner Family Distinguished Professor in Urban Education in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction and was faculty affiliate in the Department of Educational Policy Studies, Educational Leadership and Policy Analysis, and Afro-American Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Gloria Latin billings research examines the pedagogical practices of teachers who are successful with African-American students. She also investigates critical race theory applications to education. Dr. Latin billings thank you for joining us again. We are so grateful for your willingness to come back and continue this conversation today. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me back. <laughs> Let's begin with the first question. What is the difference between culturally relevant, culturally responsive, and culturally sustaining pedagogy? Well, it's a good question, and it's not surprising that people are sometimes <clears throat> confused about the terminology. If I could put it in chronological order, you will find culturally responsive in the literature earliest of the three. Uh, and it refers to the kind of work that a group of sociolinguists were doing in classrooms, particularly classrooms in relatively small or what I might say is ethnically encapsulated communities. So in, oh gosh, like the Odawa Sioux uh, community, in Hawaii with uh, Native Hawaiians, um, the idea was to look at the linguistic um, links between students' performance. Um, and so you'll find names like Kathy Jordan and Kathy Au, that is Au, A-U, uh, Fred Erickson and Gerald Mohat, um, uh, Roland Thorpe, all of whom are social linguists. So they were really looking at the, the sort of interactions and that work was primarily, it was called culturally responsive, culturally concurrent, culturally mitigated, uh, often was trying to figure out how could you take students language and um, kind of map it 
onto the mainstream so that they could be successful, more successful in the mainstream uh, classroom. What I tried to do with culturally relevant is a little bit different. First of all, I wanted to move out past language and it wasn't just about the social linguistic issues, but it was about the uh, larger issues that students were dealing with. So culturally relevant takes as its base an assumption on uh, the part of the teachers that the society is not fair, that it's not about me trying to fit you into an unfair system. So that's different than me trying to take whatever you have and, and get it to work in what exists. It is a challenge to what exists. And so culturally relevant is, is not just the language, but it is also um, ideas about the histories, it's ideas about how you think about the very nature of knowledge. So culturally relevant is more, it's not micro, whereas culturally responsive is often about just in that classroom. Culturally relevant starts in the classroom, but it's linked to the larger social ideas. Culturally sustaining is the newest term. And I think any theorist who is not willing to see the theory grow and develop and change is not really interested in helping people. So people like Sammy Aleem from UCLA and Django Parrish from the University of Washington began to look at how can we expand notions of cultural relevance to this notion of sustaining uh, when you think about, say, for example, language revitalization, what does that mean if you're working with indigenous mm -hmm. folks whose language is, is dying? Um, or what does that mean in cultures where people are literally being kind of wiped out? So whereas I started with African Americans in a very complex environment, the U.S., culturally responsive started in much smaller encapsulated environments and then culturally sustaining is probably more global. Thank you. Next question is, what first step recommendations do you have for implementing culturally relevant pedagogy in a majority white school district, especially one where colleagues or parents might be against it? So I want to be clear, culturally relevant pedagogy, it's not a program, okay? It's why I've never tried to sell it. People have approached me, publishers have come to me, they want to put it on a CD, they want it on a DVD, they want it on a, it's not that. It is an orientation towards teaching. So it doesn't start with trying to recruit a bunch of colleagues. It starts with each individual teacher's orientation towards the students, towards the society, towards the very knowledge that they are being asked to impart. So you're never gonna sort of first step it if you yourself don't have a, an attitude towards the students and towards knowledge and towards the development of social relations that has changed from the status quo. So I, you know, I would caution people from thinking and every time I, you know, I, I know that New York, for example, has adopted um, this culture. New York City Public Schools have adopted what they're calling a culturally responsive approach. But they've asked me to come and talk about it. And mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's something you can impose. I think you have to believe certain things about the students, about their culture, and about the knowledge that you're trying to impart. So you're never going to get colleagues who are against it to do it. The other thing is when you say we're uh, parents, the people that I work with who I term culturally relevant, they don't call themselves culturally relevant. I used to always say all the time that, you know, there's, you, you're not gonna walk into a place and see people with a t-shirt on that says, I'm a culturally relevant teacher. Until I went to a conference once and they were actually selling t-shirts. And I was like, oh, no, no, that, that's not what it is. What these folks are doing is teaching. It's what they believe about teaching. 
and they are contrasted with those who I've termed who are assimilationist teachers. Now, I want to say that assimilationist teachers are, quote, bad. What I'm saying is they have a different orientation towards what they are doing. They, for example, believe the society just is. And that's it's just the way things are. And if you, if you work hard and do well mm -hmm. and do what I tell you to do, then you'll probably move up and fit into the right place. But if you don't, if you don't listen to me and if you don't follow the rules, there's a place for you too. It probably involves flipping burgers or it may involve you being incarcerated. It may involve you being uh, without work and homeless. They are not questioning the structure of the society. Culturally relevant teachers are. What a great response. I think we hear this question a lot when it comes to educators who are in more rural districts and they're just afraid of even pointing out that there might be students who participate in another culture because they don't know how to approach it. And I, you know, I think it's interesting that some of the more exciting work that I've seen done, you know, because to do this work, I've had to go across the country and around the world and I see it everywhere. People just don't advertise it. They don't have a name for it. They think this is the way you're supposed to teach. So some of the more exciting work that I've seen done has been done in rural communities. If you've ever followed the whole Foxfire series, the way that, that Elliot Wigington was able to develop that program was to tell kids, go home and have a conversation with your grandparents about whittling. Okay, and we'll come out and we'll film it, and we'll put it in a magazine, and that your writing is about how your grandfather began whittling. Your writing is not about um, what, what, what is it like to live mm -hmm. in the 21st century. No, it's, 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 it's linked to where you are, same set of skills. Uh, and, and, that, and often kids were being asked to think about well, why isn't the fact that your grandfather is an excellent um, singer of ballads? Why don't we hear that on the radio? Okay, so now the kids have to begin to think, well, yeah, he's been singing ballads as long as I know. He's on the porch. We all gather around in the evening. We listen to it, but you'll never hear that on the radio. So now you got a whole other set of questions. Well, why doesn't this make it on the radio? Why isn't this as important? So it's, it's so... Uh, linked to the experience of the students, where they live and where they come from. At the same moment, it is challenging the idea that if you're rural, you can't do X, or if your first language is other than English, you shouldn't be allowed to do Y. Can you briefly explain the culturally deficit model of thinking and how it may show up in schools around Wisconsin? So this notion of cultural deficit goes back in the literature a very, very long time. Um, it became very popular during the time of the Moynihan Report where Daniel Patrick Moynihan published a report that talked about the problem with black kids was that they came from these um, households where um, they didn't have a dad at home. Uh, at that time, it was about 25%, um, which meant 75% of the kids did come from households with it. But, but we, we focused in on this 25% and that these mm -hmm. households were led by uh, mothers, uh, matriarchs, as you will, and so the, the boogeyman became the black matriarch, this overbearing mother um, who didn't speak to her kids enough, didn't share enough words, who didn't raise them in a particular way. And then a whole stream of research came out of that to say, this is what's wrong with these kids. So we have an entire um, compendium of research about cultural deficit. Um, finally, I would say in the late 80s, early 90s, you began to hear some counter voices. 
So for example, one of the things, when well, there was a report that said that you know researchers had gone into the households of black families with small children, with infants and toddlers, and that the children, they didn't have enough toys to play with, to interact with. Um, so they didn't get the proper stimulation. Well, in the 80s and 90s, you started seeing black researchers go into these households. And then one of the things that they saw was, well, the kids had toys, they had plenty of toys, but the toys were in the playpen. And the baby was almost never in the playpen. The baby was always in somebody's arm. Somebody was always holding the baby. You never, you rarely saw um, these parents just put their kid in a playpen, which was what middle class parents were doing. Put them in a playpen, give them something to play with. Well, what that meant was that black children turned out to be very um, person oriented, not object oriented. And it's funny because I saw a study being done, literally in progress on computers in the early 90s, where uh, the researcher had, she was doing working with boys, so she wanted to, to eliminate the gender issue. And the question that she was looking at was whether or not you could tell the difference between someone who had been actually prepared to be a teacher versus someone who was a graduate student, but could kind of teach. And what struck me is watching her videotapes is in the tapes where she had um, two little white boys at the computer, they were kind of nudging and pushing each other, trying to get to the computer screen during the whole time that the person who was trying to teach them was talking to them. When she showed another clip, these were two black boys and she wasn't controlling for race, she was controlling for gender. The black boys turned away from the computer and towards the teacher and listened to the teacher. They were much more person oriented, not object oriented, but the cultural deficit literature was suggesting that being linked to objects meant you had a richer culture. So now what you started to see, and I think this is where cultural responsive and, and culturally concurrent and those things start to come from, was it's, it's not cultural deficit, there are cultural differences. So that's kind of where the new literature began to say, let's stop saying this one is better than the other, or this one is deficient, or this is deprived let's say that they are different and that what does that mean in a classroom? Um, so I think, but what's been scary is that even though we have moved towards cultural difference, there's been a, a revival of the deficit notion. And that revival came in the um, form of all of this stuff about the culture of poverty. Uh, and as someone trained in anthropology, I deeply resent that whole notion because poverty is not a culture. If it is, then it's the dominant culture of the world because 75% of the people in the world are poor. Poverty is a set of social arrangements. So it is important to understand that our job as educators is not to quote, fix students' culture. It's to learn with and from it so that we, so we can help them become much more effective in a very complex world they will enter. So, um, you know, I, I just think we, the fact that we use the notion of race, which is a very spurious concept, keeps placing us in this place of cultural deficit because race is only used for one thing and one thing only. That is to rank people, to decide this is the best group, then this is the next best group, and this is the next best group. As long as that's the driving um, framework for our thinking, we're going to keep coming up with saying that things people are, are deficient. We'll, we'll pretty it up. And there are even people who think they are doing, quote, something culturally responsive, but they really are thinking, oh, that's for those kids. One of the challenges that I try to offer teachers is that cultural relevance is for all kids. 
that white students need to become culturally competent. And I don't care if they're in a rural environment. I have been on a farm outside of, you know, I guess New Glarus. And on that farm, there were people from around the world trying to learn these new dairy um, uh, techniques. Those farmers who were graduates of the University of Wisconsin's College of Agriculture and Life Science had to have enough cultural competence to be able to work with those farmers from Japan and those farmers from Pakistan and those farmers from North Africa. So even if you are going to stay on the farm, you're likely to be engaged in a much more global um, community than your parents and your grandparents. The next question is, how can non-Black teachers, and you touched on this a little bit on our last event, how can non-Black teachers avoid cultural appropriation when applying culturally relevant pedagogy or using hip hop in the classroom? I really appreciated what you had mentioned about, you're not asking people to use hip hop, but you're asking them to be hip hop. To be, yes. Mm -hmm. And so I think it is important, you know, what is your, what's your reason for wanting to, to know about this. So I've had the distinct pleasure of teaching in bilingual classrooms, both in Philadelphia and in California. In Philadelphia, my students were African-American and uh, Puerto Rican primarily. I had a few um, Cuban students, but mostly Puerto Rican, that the neighborhood's Puerto Rican and black. And then when I went to California, mm -hmm. I worked with students who were African-American, Mexican-Americans, and um, Samoan. Um, so here are these different cultures that I don't know about as I go into these communities. But one of the ways that I get to know about the communities is I like to visit folks in their, in their communities. Um, with my Puerto Rican students, I visited their homes. I told them, I said, I'm coming to your house for dinner. Tell your mom I'm coming, all right? Because one of the things I learned is that it was an honor for the teacher to, to come to the house. And I had colleagues who said, I shouldn't do that. Oh, you know, those people don't have much money. And I said, well, they're gonna do exactly what my mother does. You know, just put some more water in the soup. It'll thin out a little bit. She's gonna cut the chicken in some strange ways. It won't look exactly like you used to, but it's, it's the honor is so important. Um, so the fact that you take enough time to be in the communities, to attend community events, uh, my attending quinceaneras in California made a huge difference in the way that students uh, responded. Among the Samoan um, community, I learned that the, the community often has a chief. And so to be able to uh, communicate and speak with the chief about some of the things you'd like to do um, honors them. Um, there's certain things I would never do. I would, you know, I'm, I'm not asking anybody to dress up. Um, you know, one of the things that frustrates me here, even at the university, my international students are often asked to come to elementary schools and they want them to come in quote native dress. And I'm like, what does that mean? And so I actually call the international, the, the office that does this work. I said, so you're telling me if a US student was in one of these countries and asked to come in native dress, they would dress up in a pilgrim suit? I mean, it's, again, it's, it's this trivializing the culture. Um, one of the things that I think students need to understand is that there's certain things about urban culture. I don't care where you are. I don't care if you're in Dubai, um, Lagos, Nigeria, Tokyo, or New York City. There is something about urban culture that's very similar. It's dense. It's crowded. You know, it relies on public transportation. People are not nearly as nice. And I'm just saying because they're busy, that it's different from a rural culture. So I've been to Kenya and I've been to Nairobi where urban culture is crazy. But once you get out in the countryside, it's very mellow, very calm. Uh, 
which is a lot like being in the countryside uh, here in the US. So we, we're, we're, we're making categories and fixing them, all right? And, and the wonderful thing about human beings is human beings have an infinite amount of, or array of ways in which they group and assemble themselves. So none of these notions of what it looks like, you know, um, what the culture looks like are fixed. You have to just approach this as a learner. What is it that I can learn and how can learning something help me uh, ensure that students do well? The next question is, and this has been popping up in the chat a lot, what does culturally relevant pedagogy look like in an early learning environment? Oh, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm actually a secondary person. And so I had to really learn about early learning um, through the eyes of my own children. Um, I was a participating parent when my daughter went to preschool and I just, I learned a whole lot. Um, I learned that we are quote, teaching children about race and difference all the time. Uh, we think we're not, but we are. I had this experience, which I've written about, um, where my daughter was in preschool as a three or four year old at the time. And there was a, a youngster in her class who was a recent immigrant from Italy. And I, I remember uh, him coming to me, asking me which of the two black kids was mine, because only two black kids in the class. And he said, which one is yours? And I said, oh, the girl, she's mine. But you could tell there was an uneasiness among the other adults that he would notice. And there was absolutely nothing wrong with him asking that question. He was making an observation. My skin looked a lot like the two other children's skin. It didn't look like his. He knew I was a parent because I was a participating parent. I wasn't a regular teacher. And it was an innocent question. A few days later, that same little boy came to school and he was wearing a beautiful, obviously handmade sweater. And I said to him, uh, oh, wow, that sweater is beautiful. Where'd you get it? He said, my grandmother in Italy, she made it. And she made me one and she made my sister one. She made my mom one and she made my dad one. And I said, oh, wow, I'm gonna come and live at your house so I can get one of those sweaters. And he said, well, you can't live in my house. We don't have any brown people at my house. Again, he's three or four, he's making an observation. Can I tell you that the adults in that room went nuts? They were like, oh, Mario, that's not nice. Now there was nothing not nice about what he said, but what I, in this paper, what I argue is that we are funding that concept of race for him because he didn't have it in place in the same way as American kids do. He's learning about this thing. And I, I posit that by the time he's about six or seven, oh, he'll know there's some certain mm -hmm. things he can't say. He'll know that that's out of bounds because we keep trying to make it mean more than one. Now, we all do it. I'll give you an example of me doing. By the time my daughter got to kindergarten, her very best friend was a recent immigrant from China and they were um, thick as thieves. They stayed, I mean, they everything they did together, um, I think primarily because we were, they were next door neighbors, they were in the same classroom and this little girl was acquiring English. So, you know, my daughter was her closest connection. So every single day after lunch, they went to a um, half day kindergarten in the morning She'd come home, she'd go home and eat lunch. But right after she finished her lunch, she showed up at my doorstep. And one day she said to me as she came over and she said, where's the white Barbie? And I said, oh, oh, honey, I don't have a white Barbie. And like a five-year-old would do, she said, why? So I said, well, I just don't think she would be that comfortable living here. Why? Well, she probably won't like what we have for dinner. You know, we probably won't serve things she'll like. Why? 
oh, she probably won't like the music we play. I mean, I just, I mean, it, it, you know, and you, if you know young children, it's an endless loop. So she constantly saying why. And I'm coming up with all these excuses for why this white Barbie would be uncomfortable. So then she says, all of a sudden her eyes light up and she says, oh, there she is. There's the white Barbie. Okay, at this point, my head is sort of spinning around like that woman in the exorcist because I'm wondering who brought a white Barbie to my house because I've been very specific about what I want my daughter to have access to. Well, guess what? It was a black Barbie. She had on a wedding dress. See what you see what I'm doing? I'm also contributing to this notion of race, making it real for a kid that she didn't care. It was just Barbie and she was, the dress was beautiful. So she was really pretty. So one of the great things I think you can do in an early learning environment is that you can have kids pay attention and notice and not be embarrassed about the noticing. Um, the great thing about early childhood is that there are some marvelous, marvelous pieces of literature that delve into these concepts and a skillful teacher will probe it with kids and say, well, what do you think about that? Well, you know, why do you think the author made his face brown? You know, the, one of the most classic children's books ever for early learning is a book by Isra Jack Keats called Snowy Day. Well, this has a wonderful history. We never talk about it. That book is the first mainstream children's book to have a black protagonist. Before that, no one had ever put a black child as the main, and all of my kids, and my kids range in age from 50 to 34. Uh, my, all of my kids got a snowy day. Now I got it because of the kid's face, although there's nothing in the story that talks about race. And as a part of a research project I was doing, I searched for lesson plans on the snowy day. I found over a hundred lesson plans online for that book. Not one of them, not one raises the issue of race. So I think it's interesting that um, we don't wanna talk about it, but it's around us everywhere. So I think one of the things that early learning can do is uh, allow kids to voice what they're feeling about certain things, to share with them uh, and in particularly right now, you, you mentioned in the introduction that I talked about the two pandemics and in the time since our last uh, meeting, I've been on a couple other Zooms and I have a colleague who said we have four. And I said, you know what, you're right, there are four. And he said the four are COVID-19, they're uh, racism or white supremacy, a likely crashing economy, it's gonna be worldwide, and climate catastrophes everywhere, right? So that's what our kids are going to grow up in. And we have to pay attention to all of those. So I think that there's so many things you can do with, with kids, um, young kids that, you know, help deal with those four realities. Thank you for sharing. And, and thank you for sharing that story too. What advice do you have for a physics teacher thinking through culturally relevant application in the classroom? And I want to note also that we receive this question in numerous ways, right? Whether it's physics or gym, insert whatever subject that isn't, you know, writing or social studies. So I think the, 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 the easiest thing to do is to be able to identify those physicists um, you know, the woman um, of getting her, I think it's Shirley Jackson, who was, uh, was head of the Atomic Energy Commission. I mean, it, it's, it's easy to kind of put some faces up there to let students see that a variety of people have uh, contributed to the field. But I think the work that colleagues like Christopher Emden have done uh, with their Science Genius um, program in which they integrate hip hop, um, and science are good examples. And in fact, the winner of the very first Science Genius um, uh, battles is a young man by the name of Jabari Johnson in 2013. And his 
presentation was a physics presentation. It was about the connection between work and kinetic energy. So it's the way that we get students interested in a kind of um, very um, uh, sort of a high level concept in physics, but in the context of what they understand. Uh, I saw another one where they did this wonderful sort of deconstruction of what's actually in that, um, the cream filling of a, uh, an Oreo for chemistry presentation. And, and trust me, once they tell you, you don't want to eat Oreos <laughs> anymore. Um, but it, they, they put all the stuff in it to keep it stable. Um, so, I mean, I think there's so many ways, you know, the simple, you know, biology, right? Many of us who took biology a hundred years ago learned about Punit squares and wrinkle peas and straight, you know, and a smooth peas. Trust me, nobody cares about those peas, nobody. But if you have a teacher who says, well, what if Rashad and Marcia have a baby? Well, the first thing you get is, oh, no, ooh, oh, you know, because that's how kids are, right? But you, when you do that Punnett square about, you know, what will the hair look like? What will the eye color be? You, you, you're, you're not, you're buying into the thing. Right now, the thing they most care about is, who are you trying to match me up with? But it's existing in their world. It's existing in their world. Physical education, uh, you know, African-Americans in particular have been so dominant in physical things because in some ways that, that's what they were brought to these shores for. But, you know, I would, you know, we didn't, we did not have an Olympics this year, but I would certainly have a conversation in a physical education class about, um, the controversies that have surrounded Olympics. Um, John Carlos and Tommy Smith's protests in the um, 1968 Mexico Olympics. Um, what are some of the controversies that exist that people believe, you know, the sort of stereotypes that people believe about physical ability? Um, I mean, I think there's just so many interesting things that we could be talking about, you know, for the current students, they've always seen NC2A uh, tournaments with black players in it, but that wasn't always the case. So when did that change? Um, they've seen always football programs out of the South, um, Clemson and Alabama. Those teams didn't always have black players in it. So when did that change? And where did those players go? I mean, I think there's so many conversations that students can be having um, that link that, that sort of sociopolitical consciousness with the content that you're sharing. Absolutely. And our last talk, you also mentioned a hard reset. Can you paraphrase what that hard reset is and talk about what are some of those required first steps? So the, the idea of the heart reset was me talking about the fact that I didn't believe that we could go back. Uh, I think I tweeted somewhere um, some weeks later that um, we don't wanna go back to normal because normal was where the problem was. Um, so this idea is not to go back to what has already existed because what already existed is very unequal what already exists, students were failing at. Um, and so the idea would be to kind of wipe it clean. We, I, used the, I used the reset as a metaphor about phones and devices that when you have to have a hard reset, all the stuff that was on there has to go. So it means starting all over. And then I also talked about the fact that we've seen places that have been through something catastrophic, World War II, for example, where you had to start all over again. Japan had to rebuild its school system. Italy had to rebuild its school system. I think that's the thing we need to do. Now, are we gonna do it? Probably not. It is not something for an individual teacher to do. It, it's a systemic change that has to happen. 
because if you're just trying to do it by yourself, but you're going to still get those same mandates from your uh, administrator or from your district officer from your state, it requires some real rethinking on the part of an industry. So think about um, when September 11th, 2001 happened, the entire airline industry had to rethink how are we gonna do, do this now, okay? It couldn't just be American Airlines saying, well, we're not gonna let people come to the gate without a ticket. Everybody had to agree. Nobody gets through the gate without a ticket. It couldn't just be United saying, well, you can't carry uh, liquids on. Everybody had to agree. And so that's, that's the hard part of this. This, this is about political will. This is not just about, oh, I'd like to start over. Uh, and I don't know if we have enough buy-in at this point. Thank you. How do we trust that social emotional learning goals and outcomes aren't steeped in white supremacist culture? Um, I'm, I'm not sure that um, we have to, I'm not sure that that's something we, we can know. Um, you know, I've seen teachers who in my mind were particularly strict, seemingly very dogmatic about certain things. But when I have had the chance to sit down and interview those teachers, um, perfect example for me is the late Marva Collins. I was very unsettled the first time I saw her. I think she was on the 60 Minutes program back in late 1970s. And it was very unsettling because she was doing all this work with typical Western civilization texts. Um, and I was like, hmm. Yeah. Cause I was at that time thinking the curriculum was, was it. What I was missing was how she was interacting with those kids how she was constantly telling them how smart they were, uh, how capable they were, how she wasn't afraid to touch them, to lift their heads, uh, to demand more and more and more from them. It was the pedagogy, it was not the curriculum. So again, we can say the right things around this socio-emotional learning, but what's our interaction gonna be like with the kids? How are we going to respond to the kid whose social emotional learning really is linked to him being really uh, excited about a particular genre of music that doesn't necessarily come across to the teacher as calming and relaxing? Maybe there's a level of excitement. I don't know if you've ever been in, in a Black church service. It's one of the opportunities that I give my students to go to. Um, they come back and they're like, oh my God, that was just, that was overstimulating. Yeah, it, 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 you know, people not just sitting there being quiet. They, they are clapping, they are stomping their feet, they are dancing, they are shouting out. And our students bring that right with them to the classroom where they're told that's not appropriate. So I'm, I'm less concerned about it being quote white supremacist as I am about it being really middle-class. The idea that you know we'll all sit on the on the yoga mat with our you know legs crossed and do you know say um now I've seen that in its own culture and it's different when one middle class people get a hold of it they turn it into something else so I think we have to uh, we have to be willing to listen uh, but we have to be willing to learn and what what's soothing and socially emotionally uh, satisfying for one group of kids is going to be different than for say another group. Absolutely. Myself and others in this webinar are educators at a school in Milwaukee, an area that is a hotspot for COVID cases. Do you have any brief suggestions on something to start the school year to address this? Uh, I think you have to talk about it. You can't pretend it didn't happen. 
Um, whether it's just starting out by having students do a free write, having them tell you, tell you, share what their fears and concerns are, um, have them talk about some of the myths that they've heard. You know, what, what have you heard about COVID-19? Um, and let's see, you know, what does the science say about it? Um, that's a perfect way to enter this as, as a science issue, right? Because kids are gonna say, oh, I heard certain people can't get it. I heard if you do this, you can't get it. Okay, now, now you got a whole set of scientific questions to investigate that you can help students with. Um, from the mathematics point of view, you know, just the notion of talking about exponential growth versus arithmetic growth, or whether you can get kids to, to graph out spread, um, whether you can get kids to look at uh, the differences in uh, communities, you know, why are there so many more cases in Milwaukee, say, than in Dane County? Uh, why are there so many more cases among black and brown people versus whites? It's not anything genetic, um, but that may come up in kids' minds. And so I think you have to deal with that and you have to deal with um, the social conditions under which people are living so that you can have a, a very frank conversations about this. Um, but I think the worst thing you can do is pretend like it hasn't happened, pretend like we haven't dealt with it. Uh, it's also an opportunity for students to talk about uh, what might happen in a next question, you know, a next pandemic. Uh, what might we do? Um, because there will be another one, uh, may not take a hundred years this time. You know, it took a hundred years from the 1918 flu pandemic. It may be 50 years, maybe 20 years. Um, you know, having them think as decision makers, what would you suggest? What do you think needs to happen? Um, and the fact that, you know, we may have it um, because of some of these other pandemics, because of the climate issues. Um. Thank you. And we've reached question number 10. And then there are, of course, a few questions too from those who are attending. Is it realistic to think that our current school leaders can reimagine our schools since our current way of schooling is all they know? Um. Anyone who lives with hope doesn't worry about realistic. I'm really in a, a place right now, given the, the death of some important people in our society. Was it realistic, John Lewis at 23 years old, to address a crowd of a quarter of a million people, to be beaten within an inch of his life crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge, to be beaten again in a um, Greyhound bus station as a freedom rider to be locked up 40 sometimes. Was it realistic for that man to be serving in Congress for 30 plus years? No. So I think if we just stay in this place of, oh, it, our possibilities are limited, then you're right. The thing is, whether you believe you can or you can't, you're right, you're absolutely right. So I think we need to get to a place where we care enough about our children, you know, care enough about the society that we say, oh, we're gonna do this. It, it, it may not happen next year, but this is where we're moving. Um, people can't imagine something without there being some uh, some, some other imagination that takes place. Um, there is nothing in my own biography that says I should be a endowed chair, nothing. My great-grandparents were chattel slaves. If someone has said Four generations from now, you're going to have a granddaughter who was at one of the major universities and she's going, she's going to be a thought leader. 
if, if they had heard that, they might have said, are you out of your mind? But instead, I think what they said is we're going to do whatever we can to get ourselves out of this situation in slavery. My own grandparents were sharecroppers, which is just a step up from slavery. It's like being in the feudal system. They can never get ahead. They can never own property. And again, their lives seemed impossible. My parents basically grew up in what we think of as um, legal apartheid, right? State-sponsored segregation, where my own mother could not try on a hat in a department store downtown. So think about every one of those generations, if they had said, well, we can't imagine um, that our kid can go off to college. I love the late Derek Bell's statement is that just because something is impossible doesn't mean it's not worth doing. And so my, my life has been filled with doing impossible things. You know, I, I had no conception of myself as a quote professor, um, but I kept having people in my ear saying, well, yeah, you could do this. Why, why, why can't you do it? You know, why, why can't you take the next step? Why can't you move a little further down the road. So I think what I'm asking us to do is not harder than slavery, is not harder than um, sharecropping, it's not even harder than legal apartheid. It's about educating some kids. That's an, as re, and every generation has its task. You cannot pass it off to someone else. This is our task. And, you know, I just don't want to be a part of a generation that fails at the task that has been given to us. That's a beautiful response. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now so that we can answer some of the questions that are in the Q&A. Let's see. One person commented, I was told by a student that referring to our student body as urban is offensive. You want to reply? Well, um, you know, I, I raised this question once before. When did urban become the ba a bad word? Um, it is a code word. Uh, people use it to basically say those children. Uh, but if you go back to its root, it means urban comes, you know, the word urbane comes from urban. And urbane means to be sophisticated. Uh, you know, what I tell students all the time is that without cities, you know, urban comes out of the city. Without cities, civilizations don't last very long. Um, you know, because one of the things about putting people together densely is that you can pull resources. So libraries, museums, um, art, music, all culture, all of that thrives in these more densely populated places. And, you know, cities didn't become uh, bad or a bad thing to be associated with until we started building interstate highways. Because there used to be a time we all lived in city. I grew up in a city that, when I grew up in Philadelphia, it was like the fourth largest city in the nation. And um, I lived in a quote, black community, but I saw white people. They lived in the city, they just lived in a, a nicer neighborhood, but we all lived in the city. Um, so we've actually created this notion of the city versus the suburbs as um, a kind of artifact to say rich versus poor, black versus white, uh, brown and black versus white. Um, the problem I have is we're using the term urban to talk about little small towns um, that have like 12,000 people, but a large number of them are people of color. So now we call it urban because we don't want to say black or brown. Thank you for that. Another question says, as a teacher educator, what suggestions can you provide regarding facilitating the development of critical consciousness in pre-service teachers? 
So the hardest uh, part of the work, I think, as a teacher educator, and of course I've done 26 years of it in Wisconsin, uh, before that six years in um, San Francisco Bay Area, is helping mostly white English language speaking Christian students understand that they have a culture because they don't think they have one. They think that they are the norm. And so everybody else has culture, uh, but they don't. Helping them recognize their own culture and the biases that are embedded in that culture is the hardest work that I do. It's not hard to get them to understand that black and brown kids uh, come from different cultural backgrounds. It's not hard to get them to see the complexities. You know, when you say brown, what, who are you talking about? Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, Ecuadorians, Dominican, that, that this is a very complex and that there's as much within group different. That, that part's not hard. The hard part is their recognition of their own culture and the uh, inherent biases that we all have. We all have biases. And they come, you know, I, I say that culture is both liberating and constraining. It feels good for me to be in a space with black folks because I, you know, I feel like I can be myself, but I'm also constrained when I get, wait a minute, you reading what? Black people don't read that, you know? So, so you get that back and forth where you feel good about being with people who are similar to you, but that they also, they're not immune to the stereotypes about the culture that then limit you. Or they'll say, well, black people don't do that. You know, black, oh, you going, you're getting a PhD, you're going to Stanford. Black people don't do that. That's, the, that's a cultural constraint. However, once I graduated, everybody was happy and proud. So, but we all have to negotiate that. If that's not unique to, to me as a black woman. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, the final question here, and I believe you touched on this a bit in the beginning. Would you say that culturally responsive pedagogy is a mindset? And if so, how would you describe this mindset? Um, it's both a mindset and a belief system. So, just like Socrates had a particular mindset and a belief system about how you interact with students and that's the way he, you know, he, he fired those questions and created those Socratic dialogues. A culturally relevant teacher has a particular mindset about who the students are, who he or she is, what the social relations ought to be in the classroom and uh, they have a conception of the nature of knowledge that they don't just assume because the school district said we're going to use book X that whatever's in book X is um, the right thing. Uh, last week I was in a conversation with a reporter from New York who is looking at the book lists that are being have been sent home to um, middle and high school students and reading lists. Some are reading it. And she wanted me to, to respond to them. And I said, you know, the, the, the issue is not the book. Uh, kids can read all kinds of things. You know, they, they like all kinds of genres, everything from science fiction. They like a lot of this dystopian stuff, uh, as well as books that reflect different race, ethnicities, gender, sexuality. All of that stuff is of interest to kids. Um, that's not, the, that's not the issue. The issue is what are you going to do with that book? How are you going to have kids engage with it? What kind of questions are you going to ask of them? What kind of tasks are you going to have them do as a result of it? How do you line those books up? So you can take a book that on the surface that I might say, oh, I don't really like that book, like um, Conrad's Heart of Darkness. Okay, I don't like that because it makes all the Africans seem so primitive and what have you. But I can take Heart of Darkness and pair it with something like Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart. And so here you got these two books about Africa. Now you got a good set of questions to ask. Well, why is this guy saying this while this guy over here is saying that? 
What's the difference in the writers? Whose perspective? Who is speaking? Um, one of the questions that I ask my students all the time, and I do a lot with both literature and film, because I do think this is a very visual uh, generation. I always ask the question, who does the author or who does the filmmaker think you are? And they kind of go, what? I said, everybody writes to an audience. Sometimes when I'm writing, I, I know when I'm writing to quote white teachers because of the venue that I'm putting it in. But I also know that I'm, I'm often writing specifically to black educators. I, I don't care that white educators read. In fact, I'm glad that they read it. Uh, I think about a filmmaker like Spike Lee. Spike Lee has been very clear. Most of my films are made with a black audience in mind. Now, do I want white folks to go see the movie? Of course I do. I want to I want to make some money in this process. So to be able to have our students recognize that there's a point of view embedded in what they read and what they study and what they experience, that that's sort of mind blowing for many of them. Um, because we keep trying to teach things as if they're all neutral and they're all objective. And that's just not the case. Well, we are at time and I am feeling so appreciative for you, Dr. Gloria Latson billings for joining us again. This was a very enlightening hour and I hope that everyone who participated today feels like some of their questions were asked and I just want to thank you again from the bottom of my heart. Well, you're quite us. welcome and everybody just stay safe, wash your hands, mm -hmm. uh, put on a mask. It's not a political statement. <laughs> okay. You need to try to keep people like me alive. Put the mask <laughs> on. Okay. And practice social distancing. Absolutely. For those of you who are attending, look out for a post event email where you will find a recording of this, a certificate of attendance, and we'll also put a link for last, the last event, Building Culturally Relevant Schools Part 1. So thank you so much, everyone. Stay safe. All right. Bye-bye now. Bye. Bye.